Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. My guest is Clement de Krop. Uh, he's the author of a book called The Idea Space. He's a Belgian-born inventor and an author to, Author with a really interesting journey we're going to hear about. He uh, came to the U.S. at age of six, and, uh, but his work has taken him around the world, which, again, has culminated in a recent book, The Idea Space, The Science of Awakening Your Non-Self. Uh, he has over 130 patents on the various technologies and uh, a lot going on. So looking forward to learning from him. Clement, thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Richard. It's an absolute pleasure. Well, tell me a bit about your background and then, you know, what led to the writing of the idea space? Yeah, great question. So kind of like you said, was born in Belgium, moved to Spain and then moved here. And when I was young, I was always interested in how the world worked on like a scientific level. So I was always nerding out on math and science and physics. So I studied mechanical engineering in school. And then after that, did some consulting at IBM. But when I was working at IBM, I was kind of like falling into a purpose gap of just trying to see if like, okay, what's the bigger picture here? Like, am I just going to grind the nine to five corporate life for the rest of my life? And so I was listening to a guy named Naval Ravikant, who is the founder of AngelList. And he brought up a good Confucius quote, which said that everybody lives two lives. The second starts when you realize you only live one. And that kind of like kickstarted a fire underneath my butt to try to do something different. And so I read a lot. And so I was like, you know what, let me try writing a book. And that was kind of the genesis for the, the whole idea. What, what is the idea? What does the idea space mean? And, you know, what is the book about? Yeah. So when I was writing the book, I was trying to write about things that had withstood the test of time. And those were, there were three major buckets, which were math, uh, physics, and history. And when I was writing about all three, the first draft was around 700 pages. And the idea space was kind of like the, the thread that brought all of those things together. So in short, an idea space is a mental model for your mind that's based on physics. So it's a way of describing the mind using the same principles that you would in physics, which is essentially math. So you're taking mathematical properties and applying them to the mind. And so diving that into one layer back is your idea space consists of your thoughts, emotions, sensations, perceptions, and the empty set. Your idea space has two key properties in that it is uncountable and has zero measure, which basically means that uncountability means that it's always changing. So like if no, th no two thoughts are the same person you were five years ago isn't the person you are today. And then zero measure just means that your idea space looks like nothing to everybody else. And you can test that by just kind of picturing a mental image in your mind. Clearly you see a mental image, but if someone else, if someone else were to ask, if someone else were to try to see that mental image in your mind, they wouldn't be able to see it. So that kind of hits on the second property that your idea space has zero measure. And so the book just kind of uses that as a framework to see how the mind fits within the rest of the universe around us based on general relativity and quantum mechanics in a way that is congruent with the existing physics, right? It doesn't kind of uphold and just like make everything else be completely new, right? It just comes in. It's like another piece to the puzzle. But what are you supposed to do with this if you consider your mind as this idea space anyway? Yeah, that's a great question. So the whole goal for this is that you create like a new science. So you have the science of objects, which is everything you can measure in physics, biology, chemistry. But then since you can't really see what's happening in someone else's mind, there's a new branch of science called the science of the first person. And so in order to study that science, we need other tools, right? And one of the main tools are different sort of meditation or mindfulness techniques like Zen, breathing exercises, transcendental meditation, you name it. There's a lot of different ones out there. And the whole goal is to show that we can take the same principles of objectivity and falsifiability found in the science of objects and apply them to the principle, the science of the first person or the science of the mind. And what that helps you do is have a, an objective understanding of the way that you view your thoughts. A lot of times, I think people struggle, including myself, uh, struggle with basic thoughts, right? We tend to get into negative thought patterns. We kind of talk down to ourselves for various reasons, just the way that we live our lives. And so through this kind of lens, you're able to see the world more objectively, including your thoughts, which allows you to reduce the amount of suffering that you have. 
it helps with suffering? Like, what, what do you mean? What would be an example? Yeah. So in Zen, one of the main principles uh, for suffering is attachment. So that's attaching to an idea of, for example, who you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to do. And by understanding that the world is impermanent and that it's always changing, you're kind of able to decouple from that attachment because it's kind of like trying to grab water with your hand. As soon as you try to grab the water, the water is going to change forms and kind of flow out of your hands. And so by being able to see that your idea space is impermanent, your idea space is always changing because it's uncountable, you're able to not attach to the different thoughts that build up. There's a good quote where it's like, as soon as something de is deemed important, it becomes a nest and then you attach to it. And that becomes kind of like the way you view the world. And then you can stubbornly attach to that, it, that idea. But then if you have new information about the world that kind of provides a new way of looking at the world, then you're, you're hard pressed to change your ways in a way. So this book allows you to kind of just reassess what's true and what's not so that you can kind of live a happier life. How do you know if the thought is useful to you or not? If it's helpful or if it's even valid? How do you, you know, what do you lay it against to evaluate it? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think like use, thought being useful, it's kind of tricky just because thoughts just kind of appear out of the blue. They just kind of show up. So I think the key is not getting tangled up in the thought and the emotions that arise with the thought. So like, for instance, sometimes like you'll just be thinking and then you'll go down a thought like a spiral where like, well, I'm supposed to be at this place and point in time, but I'm not. And then you just kind of continuously go down that spiral. And then at some point you realize that you're upset and those emotions have conjured up in your body in different ways, shapes or form, and you just feel bad. So being able to just notice when the thought that triggered the you know, initial emotion arises and iteratively backtracking to the thought that triggered that emotion is really helpful for just trying to live a life where you're not constantly in your own head 24 seven and beating yourself up. So I think that's kind of like the key to finding useful thoughts versus unuseful thoughts or just this idea of like, whether they will cause wholesome or unwholesome actions, right? So wholesome thoughts are thoughts of gratitude and kind of stimulating thoughts in an intellectual sense. And then unwholesome thoughts are thoughts of just harm, ill will, uh, and things of that nature. So just being able to catch yourself when you're thinking in those states is important. So, I mean, who is using the ideas in the book? What kind of feedback have you gotten? Is this for like executives to help kind of clear their head so they can run their company better? Or who is the audience of it? Yeah, good question. So I think the audience is threefold, three major people. The first is anyone in a transition point in life, whether you're a recent college graduate or a retiree. If you're kind of looking for the next step, in the world, like what am I supposed to be doing with myself? Then I think this book gives you the tools to just have a better understanding of what you want in life. The second is for mindfulness practitioners and skeptics. For the practitioners, it just helps deepen your meditation practice. And for the skeptics, it helps build a scientific foundation to meditation based on physics so that you can dive into meditation and mindfulness and kind of get the rewards of the practice, like peace of mind and equanimity without being thrown off by the woo-woo culture around it, which exists today. And then the last one is anyone who's scientifically curious. The book, as much as it talks about meditation and mindfulness, is very science-heavy. So if you like learning about how the universe works, if you like learning about fractals even, then it uh, definitely is the book for you. Okay. Is the rest of your work, you know, what, what else are you doing? It says you have a lot of patents. Like, what's your, you know, your main gig? Or do you involved with, with multiple projects? Like, what else do you have going on? Yep. So I did a lot of the patents when I was working at IBM. Uh, so IBM was like the number one patent producer in the world for like 29 years in a row, which is pretty impressive. So they streamlined the process for patenting. So I was just very fortunate enough to find a lot of master inventors who, for instance, this one guy that I worked with, he submitted 350 patents in one year, which is insane. But they kind of just showed me the ropes for how to make it work. So did a lot of work on the patents, um, consulting, and then now... The book is doing really well, uh, and we have cards that kind of supplement the book that are selling really well. So that's a great source of income. And we have a third card game coming out that's Cards Against Humanities, except uh, Mindful Match Edition. And then also working at IBM. I went on leave and then came back to IBM and uh, working on the deal side, working on large deals at the moment. All right. What are the cards for? Like, what do they help you do, you know, that the book does? And what, what's the add-on effect? Yeah, so... There's the two card decks that are out right now are 100 Mindful Prompts and 100 Daily Meditations. And they really serve as like a stepping stone to 
get into meditation and mindfulness if you haven't built a practice yet or if you're kind of new to the subject and don't really know where to start. So they're kind of like help you get into get introduce you to some of the concepts in the book that you may not be familiar with, like that when you read the book, you kind of know what's happening. But that doesn't mean you can't read the book without having the cards, right? If you're doing it the other way around, then you read the book, you have all this understanding of kind of what the world isn't, and then you can use the cards as a sort of reminder to come back to the intentions that you develop throughout reading the book. Okay. So you're currently doing work still with IBM. Where do you want things to go now that you've kind of, uh, you know, put this out there, the ideas from the book, you know, you're seeing the response. Is it changing the direction you want to go? Or, you know, you're just having fun with different ideas and, you know, seeing where you could have impact. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. Yeah, uh, definitely having fun <laughs> trying to see where it all goes. I think the beauty of the book is that an idea space that is hard is uh, one of the first solutions to Einstein's field equations in 60 years. So it definitely has its rigorous foundations. So I think we'll be fun to just continue exploring. But then... Obviously, not everybody's interested in Einstein's field equation other than a select few people. So the key is like, okay, how do we spread the message to a greater audience so that they can also gain the benefits of this scientific discovery? And so third card game's coming out. So that'll be fun to release. And then also going to work on a meditation app like everybody else is doing these days, it seems like. Um, but our angle is going to be integrating uh, generative AI, which is also all the craze into it and try to just try to do something new, try to do something different in order to help people live the lives they want to. Tell me about the generative AI. What what promises is it supposed to have to add it into, uh, you know, something like this? What does it do? Yeah. So the app would be simple. It's like basically chat GPT except for meditation. So you just kind of talk to it, whatever specific meditation you want in mind, writes the meditation for you, specific to your needs, and then outputs it with AI audio as well, uh, based on trained models. And so I think that'll be fun too, because it's like building the foundation for a long-term AI meditation feature. So whether you're new to the game or whether you're very experienced, you kind of come in and state kind of your experience level at the uh, upfront. And then all of the content is uniquely tailored to you based on your experience level and what you want to hear and what you want to know. And I think that's kind of like the beauty of chat GPT and generative AI in general is like, it's not, it's replacing Google in a sense, right? Where you have this intimate reaction of inter intimate interaction with what you're searching and everything. But with chat GPT, you're able to have a completely new way with the way that you react with the information that you want to get and receive. What, uh, I don't know, promising uh, applications of, of AI are you seeing so far? Are most people using it very much or is it just kind of like, yeah, you could do all these cool things just like everyone has a smartphone in their pocket. But most people don't do much with it. Yeah, I think you get a little bit of both. I mean, you get all the tech nerds that obviously love it, myself included. They can use it for coding and things of that nature, writing emails. But it's, to me, the way I, I say it's like, it's basically like, when Google came out, maybe not everybody used Google, but now everybody uses Google. In a similar light, maybe not everyone uses ChatGPT like interface now, but give it like a year or two and then everybody's going to be on it just because it's, you get the answers that you want much faster in a much more nuanced and robust way. And then I think in terms of applications, today there's so many beautiful applications from MidJourney, which makes text to images, which is beautiful, Pika Labs, which is text to video, which is really interesting. So I think there's a lot of different applications and Andrea Kaparthi, who is uh, big in that community, has a good explanation for like the large language models, which are kind of the foundation for the Gen AI in terms of like, they're like a, an operating system where an operating system is one level of abstraction higher than machine language and the binary ones and zeros that make a computer work. And these LMMs are one level of abstraction higher than the operating system and the other traditional coding languages like Python and C. And so what you're going to see is a lot of people who are a lot more people who are going to be able to interact with computers on a much more intimate level and be able to build things that we can't even conceive of today. Do you see a lot of people using ChatGPT for interesting things or is it still like early days? 
I think they're like definitely seen some interesting applications. The one that's nice is called perplexity.ai and they basically combine Google and ChatGPT. So I've used that to replace my search engine. So it gives you the sites that you want, but it gives you the answer that you need. And then some images just kind of like Google does, but it's, I think it's such that it's the infancy stages that I think a lot of the applications that are going to come out, the best ones aren't out yet. I'll put it like that. Yeah. Any promising ones that you're hoping will come out or that you're working on that you could talk about? I think the AI meditation one will be nice. I don't think it's going to be like revolutionary game changing, but I think it'll solve a, a nice little niche and help people out in their market. But I'm trying to think, I think it'll be really interesting once it becomes fully multimodal in the sense that text, image, video, speech, all of that gets kind of solved and is integrated directly into the hardware. So like you got Siri right now and Siri is obviously not the best. A lot of jokes being made around that, but it's still like a technological, beautiful thing of technology. So imagine just having like a, a Siri that's just good, like really, really, really good. I think that's kind of like the where the future is headed. And then obviously you bake that into robotics, have someone that can kind of a robot that can do all the things around the house that you want, build a smart house. And I think the, the options there are endless. Okay. Well, very good. So Mark, where can people uh, find out more and keep tabs? Like, I guess they should, you know, they should read the book first, but to go further from there with your ideas, where can they go to follow you? Yeah. So if you go to the web, my website, www.theideaspace.io, you can actually download the first chapter of the book for free if you're interested in checking it out and then get all my contact information on there. So yeah, theideaspace.io is the best place to reach me. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Richard. It was fun. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.